Welcome from me, Nick Gowing, to Marrakesh in Morocco. Can face-to-face -face meetings between the main leaders in the Middle East ever achieve lasting security and peace right across the region and beyond? The momentum for high-level negotiations seems to be faltering, despite the commitment to progress engineered by President Obama last month. Gloom and distrust between the two parties seem to be growing again. So peace in the Middle East, are the right people talking? That's our BBC World Debate from Marrakesh. Well, you join us here with delegates to the World Economic Forum regional meeting uh, in Marrakesh, but trying to air Middle East peace talks and peace issues in an impartial, balanced way for a BBC World debate like this has highlighted both the intensity uh, of feelings and emotions and the difficulties of, of even getting people to talk to each other. After the King of Morocco refused to meet Israel's President Shimon Peres, Mr. Peres refused to attend this conference. Other members of the Israeli government then declined our invitation to this debate. In fact, a number of people we approached on all sides declined our invitation to take part. They told us they would not uh, participate or even join the audience if certain representatives from another side took part. But those who are here today are willing to take part uh, in this debate. So thank you uh, to you for joining us for this BBC World Debate uh, in Marrakesh. First, we're joined by Dr. Hussam Zomlot, who is Executive Deputy Commissioner for the Fatah Commission for International Relations, representing the Palestinians normally in Ramallah. Also, Dori Gold, by video link from Jerusalem, former ambassador to the United Nations, currently president of the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. He's held official positions in a number of right of center Israeli governments, serving Prime Ministers Ariel Sharon and Benjamin Netanyahu. He's been a member of Israeli negotiating teams on many issues with the Palestinians and Arab states. And Khalid Abdullah Janahi, a businessman and banker from the Gulf, co-chair of the Global Agenda Regional Council on the Middle East, and you describe the Arab-Israeli conflict as the mother of all problems. But our discussion must also involve a lot of other people as well. Many of you here in the audience in Marrakesh, this includes young people uh, from several countries in the region, brought together by the British Council uh, as part of the Changemaker program. It selects and gathers young activists, volunteers, and social entrepreneurs interested in shaping the future. So, what might it take to have successful negotiations and ultimately an agreement that could lead to Middle East peace. That is our debate. And to help us assess the answers, I'm joined here by Professor Dan Shapiro, founder and director of the International Negotiation Program at uh, Harvard University in the United States. You analyze why negotiations work and why they fail. You provide advice to groups and governments around the world. You're going to watch and listen our to our debate and then give your assessment of what you hear at the end. Dan Shapiro, our question is, are the right people talking? In your experience, what kind of people or pa personalities offer the chances for negotiations to succeed? Right. Well, first, do the people even want to talk? Uh, there seems to be a growing resentment, growing frustration in the air, a growing disbelief that negotiation will actually go anywhere. And yet, at the same time, what is the alternative to negotiating? Is it increased deprivation for the Palestinians? Is it increased risk of insecurity for the Israelis? Is it the increased likelihood of a massive regional war? These are not very attractive alternatives. It makes negotiation much more attractive in itself. And yet, at the same time, are the right people talking? To some degree, that's the problem, not the answer. It's that everybody is talking who is actually listening. At a core, it seems this is a deeply emotional conflict, resentment, frustration, humiliation. People want to feel heard and recognized, and that helps to actually have the problem solving happen. These are two major challenges facing the region right now around negotiation. Well, let's get your view of what you hear in the next uh, 
a few minutes right up until the end of the debate to see uh, how you might be changing or modifying that view, certainly when it comes to the Middle East. Let me go now to uh, Hussam Zomlot from the Fatah position in Ramallah. Are the right people talking to try and achieve a Middle East peace deal? Like yes and no. Uh, yes, from the Palestinian side, I believe uh, President Mahmoud Abbas has been in the forefront of, uh, of the peace camp, has been very clear from day one that uh, his entire career is built on uh, uh, achieving a negotiated settlement. For that purpose, he has led a campaign all of his life, whereby today it has cultivated in the, what is happening in the West Bank in terms of institution building, in terms of the security situation, in terms of the growth we are witnessing, and in terms of this uh, momentum that you spoke about in your intro introduction, the international momentum, it is based primarily on the fact that there is a Palestinian leadership that is absolutely and adamantly pursuing on the path of peace. Unfortunately, at the Israeli side, we see nothing but the lack of a vision vis-a-vis -vis the future. We see much more pity politics in terms of keeping the coalition at the expense of the vision that you, the international community, and the Palestinians are envisaging. Let's go to Jerusalem, to Dory Gold. Are the right people talking at the moment to achieve in the end, a lasting Middle East peace? Well, what determines who are the right people is the democratic will of the people of Israel and of the Palestinians. Since 1993, when uh, Israel and the PLO signed the Oslo Accords, we have gone through six Israeli prime ministers three U.S. presidents, and two PLO chairmen. And no one reached a final peace. Let's admit, these are very difficult issues. But do you know something? I am hopeful that we can reach a final peace. Because I don't allow the failures of the past to prohibit us from thinking out of the box in new ways. Let's get a view from business and outside the political field uh, from Khalid Abdullah Jinahi. What's your view? Well, I think I go along with Dan. Uh, everybody's talking, but are the right people being listened to? I think that is much more important. People are not listening to the views of the street. And when you look at it... Who do you mean by the street? The street, I mean the 300 million people on the Arab side and 6 million in the Israeli side. That is the street as far as I'm concerned. Are you telling us that the negotiators, those negotiating, are not listening to the street at the moment? Well, let's be, I mean, because when we talk about Palestinians, it's a specific, specific issue itself. Who Obviously, needs to be talking then? Well, I mean, let's, from a Palestinian perspective, whether we like it or not, I think I heard about the democratic perspective there. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, 2006 was the election time, and somebody was elected, whether we like it or not, was called Hamas. Hamas still represent the Palestinians as far as the elections are concerned. There might be constitutional issues, but I look at it from the street perspective. Still, Hamas is there. Why Hamas is excluded? from the discussions on this issue, which is an important factor from a Palestinian side. Right, let's move on, because a lot of you have views on many of the issues that we're trying to raise uh, in this debate here in Marrakesh. Let's go to Karim Sajapur from the in Carnegie Endowment for International Peace with this issue picking up on what we've just heard about Hamas. Building on Khalid's point, Hamas, Hezbollah, Iran have seemingly become too influential to exclude from the peace process. On the other hand, trying to include them seems akin to inviting vegetarians to a barbecue because they disagree with the fundamental premise of a two-state solution. So how do we reconcile this? Hussam Zomlot. Uh, number one, I don't think uh, Hamas disagrees with the two-state solution. We have been hearing Mish'al and all the Hamas leadership really endorsing the two-state solution. Number two, they also have said that Abu Mazen goes and represents all Palestinians and he negotiates. Number one, we need to be included. If not included, we want to offer any agreement to a referendum. We do not have that problem. That problem has to be behind us. The problem we have is in Israel, and the problem is very simple. By the way, these are not difficult issues. These are very simple, straightforward. But I should Hamas be involved or not, in your view, in Ramadan? Hamas be involved once we, once we sort all of our, of our issues, yes, uh, indeed. Uh, the question is not about Hamas. Hamas is not the obstacle right now vis-a-vis -vis the peace process. The obstacle is the lack of an Israeli recognition of the very basic Palestinian political right. right. Dory Gold, here you've heard 
three loud voices suggesting that Hamas, given their success in elections, should be represented if there's going to be any chance of moving forward on Middle East peace. Your view? Well, you know, the problem is Hamas does not even adhere to the criteria that were established by the quartet just a few years ago. Hamas does not recognize Israel. Hamas does not accept past agreements. And Hamas will not renounce violence. They believe in Mukawama. They are the symbol of Mukawama, of resistance, armed resistance. And therefore, you know, it sounds very liberal to have everybody get together in the room and talk, but what are you going to talk about? You know, had Hamas been willing to accept these three basic conditions that the quartet, the United States, the United Nations, the European Union, and Russia had laid down before Hamas, that would have opened up tremendous amounts of European assistance to the uh, Gaza Strip, to the Hamas regime, but they adhere to their jihadi ideology. Let's let, be realistic. Let me, let, let me press you and on that. Therefore, Dori, Dori to bring them to the table, we, we know, we know, just we, not produce any progress. It would create a much bigger problem. We know very well the Israeli concerns about this, but let's talk about what would happen if Hamas did enter the discussions. Do you believe there would be a much greater possibility of forward momentum? Look, it's hard for some people in the West to fathom this fact, but there are organizations in the Middle East that call for the destruction of Israel, that call for the establishment of a new caliphate to replace the states of the Middle East, to replace uh, President Mubarak in Egypt, to replace King Abdullah of Jordan, to replace all the regimes. This you can't negotiate with. It would be great if you could be inclusive, but you have to read the Hamas charter. You have to see what Hamas leaders are saying. This is about as sensible as bringing Osama bin Laden to the table with President Obama. It Khalid, doesn't you, work, and Khalid, it won't work. Khalid Janahi, you're shaking your head. Well, I mean, talking about democratic process, I mean, either we accept democratic process or we don't. If the people choose who they want to be represented by, they are the ones who have been chosen. Now, we, we got to allow these people to have the time. I mean, the morning after the day before, we always remember, I don't know if it was 23rd or 26th of uh, January 2006, suddenly everybody stopped and everybody was basically hammering the Palestinians. We were in the business and we were being encouraged to do business. I can see some ex-ministers or current ministers. We were encouraged to do business in Palestine at that time and we were working at it. And suddenly we were told by congressmen, and I was at a dinner in Davos, hey, anybody who puts money into that place will be in deep trouble. Now, so you're giving basically the, the international community, the local community, the regional community, the wrong aspect here. Once you, one place you want democracy, there was corruption issues, everything was raised at that time, the democracy was called for, and we had the democratic process. We didn't see that the democratic process going through. No, uh, back to what uh, Dori said, that there are institutions in the Middle East that would want to see the destruction of the state of Israel. Yes, yes, Dori, there are, but many of them are in Israel. Many of these institutions are Israeli institutions, among them the settler community, the settler movement, the Yusha Council, who have celebrated the end of the moratorium, who have shot the first shot on the current uh, existing peace process, and who have been absolutely adamant in murdering any possibility for us to move forward. Facts are there, very striking. The matter of fact is, as we stand today, there is no Israeli leadership that is coming about very clearly saying that we recognize the Palestinian state as the Palestinians have recognized us pre-1967 borders. And what we have right now in the West Bank, you know, the last thing is, the settlers yesterday in a major Nablus village attacked the farmers burning 660. This is a daily incident. Usami Zomlot, I did ask a question though about Hezbollah and Iran, about widening it still further. As far as we are concerned, Palestinians, uh, uh, b b Iran is not our uh, main uh, uh, conflict. The conflict is, 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 is very well defined. It is with Israel. It is a matter of foreign occupation, occupying Arab land. Iran has not, does not occupy Arab land. We have no direct conflict with Iran whatsoever. Dory Gold, the idea of going even beyond Hamas to Hezbollah and Iran. Well, I think the main problem we face in the Middle East is Iran. Uh, Iran is a country which is projecting its involvement all across the region, not just in Lebanon, where Iranian officers are now in the chain of command of Hezbollah, but also Hamas. Hamas is today a satellite of Iran. 
which is, of course, why Egypt is very concerned with, with what is going on in the Gaza Strip and not just Israel. I'm actually very surprised that our uh, friend from Bahrain does not recognize the magnitude of the Iranian threat. The uh, spokesman for Ayatollah Ali Khamenei has said that Bahrain should be a province of Iran. And I heard a Palestinian spokesman mention that Arab land is not occupied by Iran. Well, go tell that to Abu Dhabi and Dubai about but the islands in the Gulf. Dory Gold, the Iranian I, I, presence in Iraq is massive. Dory Gold, so I think right now we are dealing with a region which is very different from the region that we knew back in 1991 or in 1993. Are you saying it's I inconceivable? Think both Israel, are you saying it's inconceivable that Iran could ever or should ever be brought into these negotiations to facilitate them, to broaden them? That's what the point was from the floor. Yes, well that sounds again like a very progressive and and very welcoming idea, but in reality, who is the Iranian leadership today that is making territorial demands on the Arab world? You know, it is uh the uh, Iranian leadership under Ayatollah Ali Khamenei and Mahmoud Ahmadinejad who speak about wiping Israel off the map or wiping Israel off the pages of history. So it's like a negotiation with Hamas. What are you going to talk about? You know, when the Iranians make these statements you heard, about you wiping Israel said. off the map, let me finish my sentence. They put these sentences on billboards which they attach to a Shi'ab 3 missile that can strike Tel Aviv. So what are we going to talk about? the size of the missile that they'll attack with? Khalid Let's be realistic. You heard Let's what build Dari peace said about between Israelis and Arabs and, not, and ignore those who want to destroy peace and destroy us. Well, Mr. Obama, when he came to Cairo, he extended his hand to speak to the Iranians. I mean, this is the President of the United States extending his hand to speak to the Iranians. Everything is on the table. And he said it. I mean, I, my English is not that good, but I think I heard that. Everything is on the table for discussion. So if this is the President of the United States, who's supposed to be moderating now between the two parties, uh, the Arabs and the Israelis, and he says that, so who am I to say that's a bad thing to do? Let's get a sense of the next generation. Let's go to Yara Al-Wazir uh, from Palestine. Uh, you're 17. Uh, you're one of the change makers. What's your view about this kind of discussion when it affects your future? Well, I think we have to recognize that although people are talking, in fact, the mediators of the negotiations who are meant to be neutral are not, in fact, neutral, and they are very biased. And therefore, a, a, peace, a peace deal cannot be reached if the negotiators themselves are biased. And what do your emotions say about this issue at the moment? Well, in the future, I really do hope that a peace deal can be reached because I would love to go back to my country. I would love to have the option of visiting my country. What is your reaction when you hear that, uh, Dory Gold, this, this reaction and this hope? Do you believe that it's well-founded? You're asking me what, whether the hope of peace is well-founded? When, when we hear from a young Palestinian like that. I believe, as I said in my opening remarks, that we can overcome our differences, but it requires a compromise, a compromise by the Palestinians and a compromise by Israel. It can't be made by people coming into the room saying, uh, I will only accept all of my demands or I have achieved nothing. I believe the possibility of compromise exists. There is compromise in a number of these subjects, but it's going to take persistence and hard work. Uh, I don't think the issue is the problem of the intermediaries, the diplomats from the West. The best peace that we can reach is a peace that we reach between each other. We hear a lot of talk about peace. The, we want peace, peace, peace. But in reality, things are really different, Nick. What do you mean by that? I mean by that, that for the last 20 years, while we have been discussing the end of Israel's occupation, we have been discussing the dismantling of all illegal settlements. They have tripled. What I mean by that, that we have been experiencing a game of deceit. A, ga a game of deceit that only a negotiated settlement would deliver the two-state solution, and in the end, what we get is more settlements. A game of deceit when we negotiate on the table dignity, freedom, and the end of occupation, and under the table, occupation is being deepened and strengthened. This is a game of deceit, 
and I believe the Palestinians have got to the absolute point of no return that this game is over. We are no longer interested in such a game. The path ahead of us is very clear cut. Karim Sachapur, you asked about whether this can be reconciled. You likened it to inviting vegetarians to a barbecue when it comes to the kind of radical thinking that's needed. Can you see a new way of doing it? Do you believe the right people are talking or not? Well, let me go back to an assertion raised by Dory Gold that Iran is the primary threat to Israel, it's the primary threat to stability in the region. And what we've seen empirically is that Iran's ideology, its soft power, resonates the loudest when people feel most angry and outraged and alienated in the region, specifically the 2006 Lebanon war when Israel was bombing Lebanon, and more recently the 2009 Gaza war. So if indeed Iran is the chief threat to, to Israel, which I, I don't deny that's the Israeli belief, uh, the best way to drain the swamp, if you will, and weaken Iran's soft power is in fact by making forward progress uh, on the peace process with the Palestinians. So, I think that is something that Israel hasn't really uh, made a true effort to do, it seems. Let me pick up on this issue of, um, you know, has Israel made sacrifices for peace? For example, in the Gaza Strip, Israel unilaterally withdrew from Gaza. And our expectation was that if we pull out our army, if we pull out 9,000 settlers, the situation should get quieter. It should stabilize. And, of course, what happened? The number of rocket attacks, if you compare 2005 to 2006, you find a 500% increase in rocket attacks. You suddenly find, and this is important for those who don't believe Iran is a problem, that Hamas leaves the Gaza Strip, the members of Hamas, the operatives, through the tunnels under Rafiyah, fly to Tehran, where they're in, trained by the Revolutionary Guards, who also supply the Grad rockets that hit Ashkelon, Ashdod, Beersheba. Therefore, Iran is very much a part of this conflict, but it is a uh, factor which is making the conflict worse. Only by pulling Iran away from this conflict can, perhaps, we begin to bridge differences in these sensitive areas of security. One thing the Israeli government is asking, and it is repeatedly saying to its friends, we cannot allow the West Bank situation to replicate what happened in Gaza, where we pulled out completely and all we got was a 500% increase in rocket fire. Hussam Zonglot, the, yes, um, the view from Fatah. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm glad he's mentioning Gaza, another very uh, full-fledged example of what is happening. Uh, you pulled out of Gaza, Dori. You did not even coordinate with the Palestinian Authority. Mr. Dahalan was there in Gaza. He was able, and our colleagues were able to talk over. You left it absolutely empty. You planned what happened. Gaza has been put under siege since 1991. The disconnect is not Palestinian. It's physically an Israeli. You have prepared for the current situation, and now we sit and say, look at Gaza. It's far away. It's disconnected. There is disunity. We cannot talk to them. Before Iran, Mr. Gold, you spoke about Iraq. Iraq was the biggest threat. Iraq is standing between us and peace. Then we took off Iraq, off the map. Now we talk about Iran. No, no, no. No, no, no. All before that, you were talking about the lack of Palestinian leadership. Can you do that now? Can you talk of Abu Mazen, who is not a, a man of peace? Before that, you were talking about security. Can you claim that the security in the West Bank now is the best that Israel has witnessed in its history so far? You talk about economic and institutional capability, that the Palestinians are un unable to govern themselves. Go and read the World Bank report three weeks ago, saying that the Palestinians are absolutely ready, not only to govern themselves, but to be one of the most vivid states in the region. All these are excuses. These are pretexts because you are not ready to proceed on the path that we all know what it is. You are not ready to pull out of the occupied territories, period. Right. Let me go. <laughs> Yasmin Mohamed Galal. I want to say something. I wanted to go a step back. I think we need to ask ourselves why the Palestinians have voted for Hamas and why the Israelis have voted for Likud. I think this is because there's a lot of fear and stereotypes about both sides in both regions. I'm hopeful that next time when the Palestinians and the Israelis get to know each other, the Palestinians who really want to make peace and the Israelis that really want to make peace, spread awareness, get to know each other. Next elections, we are not electing this kind of people again, extremists. And I, what I see from here, people accusing each other. And if these are the people negotiating, then we do have a problem. The gentleman there. Unfortunately, we don't have alternatives. People in the Arab world are always restricted. 
I want to ask one question for the politicians in Palestine and the Arab world. Why do not the politicians in the Arab world and Palestine be brave and say, we are in a deadlock. We cannot make anything for the peace process. We are failure, in a failure. Say one thing, we are losers. Khaled Janahi, is that the kind of view that you were representing when you talked about the hundreds of millions on the street, as you put it, at every level of social strata? Well, I'm not a politician, but that's only one. Your business, though. Yeah, but that's all. Would you like? Would you like to step in and start negotiating yeah, but that's only, instead that's, of politicians? Well, no, no, I'll go. Oh, I'll, I'll be a dead duck. But no, I think <laughs> c com coming to a point, I think who's talking and who should be talking is very, very important. But I mean, does they, that represent a very critical view it, or not? Th that's the frustration. That's the emotional aspect of the frustration, which is down, in the, and that's what I was saying at the beginning. That is what we got to work. That's the time bomb. This is the mother of all problems. That's the time bomb that we have to be aware of in 10, 20 years down the road. Things the way that things are going today. I think the young lady, Palestinian young lady, when she raised, I would hope to go back, he said, the people who are basically moderating the peace, because you have peace between two parties. And reality, check is the following. You have a weak party and you have a strong party. And the problem is the moderator today, whether we like it or not, actually, whatever the strong party does, wants, they are with them. They are not on the other side. They've, they've proved that to be the point. I mean, that's a fault within us and the Arabs. I mean, when I have the Congress uh, corridors of the United States where the decision taking happens, the Israelis have basically over 150 lobbyists. The Arab, 22 Arab countries, they have six lobbyists. That's all. I mean, that's an issue. In Brussels, they have over 160 lobbyists. I think we don't have except more than a dozen lobbyists. These are important issues that, bottom up, we have to think about it from the Arab street perspective to push it through. Because that, at the end of the day, for me, the more thing, important thing is people. I mean, we all have to live. It's the humanity aspect. I mean, we bash each other. When we talk about sacrifices, we talk on the other side, compromises. I mean, the more land you take and the more powerful you are, then the compromise on the other side becomes much more difficult. So you're getting to the point, which I think I'm a, a good accountant, I think at the end of the day, is it a viable two-state solution or not, the way things are going today, with all what is expected from a perspective of <coughs> compromise, compromise. That accusation that really you're not admitting that everything is deadlocked, is that your view, is that your perception and analysis at the moment, that everything is deadlocked or not? Uh, perhaps uh, if, if that is the analysis, then uh, leaders would have to resign or do something else. Uh, what is the analysis? The, the role of the leaders is to pursue every door possible. What is the analysis for then? The, the, the analysis is the current situation as it stands with the current Israeli government. We have absolutely no way to believe that we are about to witness a breakthrough. Is it deadlocked? Uh, 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 as far as the current Israeli government, it's a big deadlock. It's the biggest deadlock we have witnessed. This is a government that is interested in its own survival at the expense of the survival of their own people, at the future of their own people. Right, Dory Gold, again, you heard that view from Egypt, particularly this suspicion that politicians on all sides simply cannot cope with what he described as deadlock. No, I think uh, the deadlock can be overcome. You know, you also have to take into account that Israel and the Palestinians have negotiated before. I know much of the global focus lately has been on the issue of settlements. But you know something? While Mr. Olmert was negotiating with uh, Abu Mazen, with Mahmoud Abbas, Israel was building in its communities in the West Bank, and the Palestinians were building in their communities in the West Bank. We have a territorial dispute where we pour concrete or they pour concrete is not going to determine the borders. We had settlements in the Gaza Strip. We pulled out 9,000 people. So I would hope that people would stop using this issue to say that negotiations are hopeless. You know, I could also come up with demands of the Palestinian side. Why don't they close the Janine refugee camp and move everybody out into nice housing? Well, Abu Mazen is not going to do that. He can't do that. That will undermine his internal position because of the sensitivity of that issue. We understand that. I think good negotiation means you don't undermine the status of the other side, of its leadership. You don't try and weaken them, you try and strengthen them. We're always seeking to do that. So again, I want to repeat, I uh, think that we have differences that can be bridged, but our approach in this television program should not be to dig up the dirt on the other side so we make an impression on the BBC audience. What we should be doing is trying to be forward thinking, understanding the limitations of the other side, 
but trying to come up to areas where we can bridge our differences. And indeed, that's, that's what I'm what's trying required. to do, Dari Gold. Not simply doing these recitals of what the other side didn't do and how it violated agreements. I've got my list, too. Let's take two or three more interventions from the floor, please. Qatar has not had elections, and uh, the PA has not had elections for a very long time, and it's a big question mark to the Middle East whether, in fact, Fatah can represent the will of the Palestinian people, given that there have not been elections for a very long time. What is the credibility uh, for Fatah to negotiate on behalf of the Palestinian people? Is it going to persuade the people who elected Hamas in Gaza um, that they are able to credibly represent uh, their wishes? Dori Gold, do you have a view similar to the question we've just heard from Human Rights Watch, that there are questions over the legitimacy of the leadership in Ramallah? Is that a view in Jerusalem? It is not up for Israel to pick Palestinian leaders. And it is not up for Palestinians. It's not up to them to pick Israeli leaders. Our peoples pick our leaders, and our leaders negotiate. Now, there has been a view among some of the speakers today that we should speak to Hamas. I mean, do you again know what you are dealing with? I just want to make sure you understand what's in the Hamas covenant. One sentence. Israel will exist and will continue to exist until Islam will obliterate it. Hamas speakers in Gaza, like Yunus al-Astal, talk about Mahraka al-Yehud. It means the Holocaust of the Jews. That's the language coming out of the Hamas leadership today. Should I tell you what, so uh, what are we Obadiah supposed Yosef to speak said, about? Should I, I think you, our job is to work you, with Mahmoud Abbas, with the Palestinian what, Authority Ob leadership, Yosef, to try and solve the this conflict. Of the Not to look, look in the past, but to look to the future. Dr. Zablat. Should I really remind you of what Ovadia Yosef said two months ago? He used the occasion of a religious convention to pray and to ask God, his God, not my God, that all the Palestinians, chiefly among them the Palestinian president, will perish. And that sits on the top of the second most significant political movement in Israel. These are the details. You shouldn't really uh, 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 discuss it here. This person here, this person there. We can sit until tomorrow to quote some of your constitutions. Khalid Janahi, can I just ask you, what's your view in response to that question from Human Rights Watch? No, about I, th the Palestinian I think, I think actually I, I, I just heard the answer, which was a good answer, that the Palestinian people choose their leaders and the Israeli people choose their leaders. So we cannot say then once we choose the leaders and the leaders are supposed to be negotiating, that's what I heard, the leaders should negotiate on behalf of them, that if they are chosen to be Hamas or Fatah or Z or X or Y, they are the chosen, basically, leaders for, that, for those people. So if they are the chosen ones, and just following the logic, is that we then, the leaders negotiate on behalf of the people, then we have to sit and talk to Hamas or Fatah or Z or X or Y. But I think, to, coming to your point, I just want to raise two things here. Since it's an important thing to not to forget the, the street. The street is a very important factor. But there are two sides, again, are the, there are people talking. They need to be involved much more. I mean, the Arab League has to get much more involved. They have got their peace initiative in front of the world. They're sitting there. It's been sitting there for eight years now. I think they need to be more proactive rather than just always just going through the United States because from what that young lady said, the United States cannot be an easy, because it's going always with the strength rather than going with the weak. So they cannot be taken there. So we have to be, the Arabs have to push more forward with the Arab Peace Initiative. Right, let's get a few more views, please. Peace sometimes begins with small gestures, ping pong diplomacy. <clears throat> I'd be curious to know from Mr. Zumlaut and Mr. Gold, what sort of small gesture would Palestinians be willing to make that they think could raise confidence among Israelis? And similarly for Mr. Gold, what kind of small gesture could Israel make to raise confidence among Palestinians? I tell you what is the Israeli, in the last three weeks, what have been the Israeli gestures? Number one, an oath that would come against the, uh, an oath for the Jewish state by the Christians and by the Muslims in the state of Israel. Number two, a law within the Knesset that says that any issue that has to do with Jerusalem and Golan Heights would have to be under a referendum. Another obstacle Israel er er erected two weeks ago. And guess what? Now we are back to talk about the Jewish right, state. Right, let me ask Dory Gold. Uh, Dory Gold, these obstacles. That, that question on, on gestures quickly. While we freeze and have frozen uh, the growth of Jewish communities, Israeli settlements in the West Bank, we are willing to be as supportive as possible for the building of a new Palestinian city called Rawabi, right next to Ramallah. And Thank if it you. requires 
uh, making Thank concessions you. about moving Thank through Area C. The Israeli government has indicated Thank a willingness you. to do that. That's tangible. That's housing. That helps Palestinians move forward. And Israel is willing to do that. But I have one request of the Palestinian side and indeed of many of the uh, Arab representatives. We are willing to recognize the right of the Palestinian people to a nation state of their own. Can somebody please say to me that they are willing to recognize the right of the Jewish people to a nation state of their own? And if they can't say it, explain to me why. David Rosen. While the conflict is a territorial conflict, uh, religion is often used and abused. And indeed, in attempts to bring about a successful peaceful resolution in negotiations in the past, we saw extremists on both sides try to torpedo it, whether it was uh, Islamic fanatics or in the name of their religion trying to bring the peace process down, or whether it was uh, Yigal Amir or uh, the assassin of uh, Yitzhak Rabin. Um, and we've seen how religion can be abused uh, but nevertheless, at the same time, there has been no attempt to try to engage constructive religious views. There is today a council of religious institutions of the Holy Land that represents the chief rabbinate, the Islamic uh, authorities, the patriarchs of the Holy Land. Are you engaging them to ensure that religion is part of the solution rather than part of the problem? And let me go to Mr. Masri, uh, a leading industrialist from the Palestinian side. I wish, I wish the Israelis will come to their senses and to think they should be the right people to talk to the Palestinians who are dying for peace. I'm dying to see peace. All my life I've been working for peace, but I haven't seen it from the Israeli side. Well, as Mr. Masri knows, Israel, this Israeli government removed dozens of roadblocks that were necessary for our security concerns. People forget that just a few years ago, we had suicide bombers coming out of Jenin, Nablus, into the heart of Tel Aviv the heart of Jerusalem. Our children were afraid to walk in the streets because of these mujahideen that were killing themselves and killing 10, 12 Israelis each time. We removed those roadblocks. We took risks for, for, the, for the Palestinian economy. And now the Palestinian economy, you're right, is vastly improving. It has a very strong uh, GMP per capita growth. And we want that to happen. But frankly, we do have our differences. We do believe a compromise is necessary. Resolution 242 never said Israel has to go back to the 49 armistice lines. You know that. We know that. We have to negotiate borders. So if some parts of the West Bank are retained by Israel where we have settlement blocks, if we work out land swaps, don't tell us that the occupation is continuing. Right. That let me is ask, let me not true. Let me ask In fact, you Zomlod. now have self-government, so I don't no, know how Mr. you make self-government no, no, consistent Mr. with one, the one issue point, of charge please, of Mr. occupation. Zomlod. Two points very quickly. No, Mr. Gold, only you know that. We, the Palestinians, and with us, the entire world, know that the borders are clear, cut, set, based on United Nations resolutions. Those are the borders of the 5th of June, 1967. This consensus includes the United States of America, and that's why you don't have one foreign mission, one one embassy in West Jerusalem, let alone uh, East Jerusalem, you are lonely and isolated in that position, number one. Number two, the issue Why of borders. Why are borders number, number an two, issue? The issue, the issue Why of, are borders because an you issue want for my negotiation borders, I tell you, I tell you, I tell you, Oslo, I didn't interrupt you, you. I didn't interrupt you, Mr. Gold, but I tell you why. Why are borders an issue for negotiation? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why, if you hear me, I'll tell you why. Because you want my border to be a function of your settlements and colonies and a function of your security. You don't want it to be a function of my rights. You have this concept that might has to be the main battlefield whereby your diktats will determine upon the final status issues. You have tried it for 20 years. You have imprisoned the Palestinian founder, Yasser Arafat. You have invaded Gaza. You have bombarded people. You have killed 1,400 civilians. It doesn't work, Mr. Gold. Khalid it does not work. Hamas did not fire a single rocket. And Hamas did not fire a single rocket. I understand Khalid, your understanding Khalid, Khalid, of history. Khalid. Do you feel that there's any grounds for optimism that the right people are talking at the moment or not? Well, if you're going to lose optimism, I mean, you got, you got, as I said at the beginning, people are the most important thing, the human beings that we're talking about. I, from a Palestinian perspective, I think before we blame the world at large, we should basically look at ourselves too. I mean, I see what I hear today is a good thing to hear. We got to look at ourselves. We got to basically blame our leaders, blame the Arab world before we blame the world. 
Because going and blaming the world for what's going on is not a good thing. We've got to basically fight it harder. That point from Rabbi David Rosen about the role of religion, in other words, extending it even further. Both of you are nodding agreement. First of all, Dory Gold. I think Rabbi Rosen's point is excellent and very important. I think ultimately the uh, identities of the people involved in the negotiations are rooted in religious identities. The pe people coming from the Palestinian side are, for the most part, Muslims and aware of Islamic tradition. Those who come from the Israeli side are steeped also in a, a Jewish background. And therefore, I believe a, a meeting point of religious leaders would be very important to fight against the corruption of religion, the distortion of religion. You know, I remind you that in, um, we're, I'm speaking to a group in Morocco, several centuries ago, uh, Moroccan Jews and Moroccan Muslims would leave Morocco and cross North Africa together. The Muslims would go to Mecca for Hajj, the Jews would go for a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. We have a tradition of coexisting, living together. We have had difficult times in our history, but there have also been bright sides when the Jews left Spain under the Inquisition and found a home in the Ottoman Empire. Many came to the land of Israel, to Eretz Israel, to live. There is a basis for us looking to a past to construct a new future, but we need an ideology of real coexistence and not an ideology of who's to blame and retributions and uh, not looking forward. All right, Hussam Zomlot, you nodded agreement as well with Rabbi Rosen. Absolutely, absolutely. Rabbi, uh, religion could be a double-edged sword. Unfortunately, it has been the sharp one cutting all of us so far. I agree with you. It has to be the other side of the sword and the other side, Judaism is a religion that I was raised by my grandfather to look up to. He always tell me, eat with a Jew, go out with a Jew, live with a Jew. It's a religion that has, been, that has the Ten Commandments. I just arrived from the U.S. The Jewish community in the U.S. are the Democrats, are the ones who supported Martin Luther King, are the ones who are with the civil rights. The problem is when it comes to Israel. All this changes, all this is transformed into confusion. I want to see what is Jewish in preventing the people of Gaza from having nets to go fishing. What is Jewish of preventing a woman delivering her baby on a checkpoint? This is not Jewish. I think Judaism is free of all these acquisitions. You're asking, are the right people are talking? I'm not going to comment about the gentleman on the TV, but I will comment about our brother in Palestine. How are you expecting two brothers to make peace with their cousin when they cannot make peace with, between each other? You can't. The Hamas and Fatah has to make peace between each other, and then they can go and negotiate with power. It's a very legitimate and profound question at the moment. Not only it is possible, Nick, but it is an absolute necessity for Is it achievable? It's achievable, and I have good news for you that our colleagues now are doing a good job. They're good news that things are very close to a breakthrough. I think Palestinians know that this is a top priority. What, it, what, what is blocking it? And very logistical details. So far, uh, I believe we are very close to uh, uh, resolving this. We are waiting for the Hamas leadership to uh, come along and sign the Egyptian uh, paper. We have been talking to them in various capitals in the Arab world. Um, the, the most important thing is that there is a popular pressure underneath all the politicians that this is a necessity. There is a Fatah decision that this is a top priority. There is a Palestinian leader who knows that this has to be achieved as soon as possible. And I believe Hamas has a long way to go, but there has been some, some achievements. The bottom line is there is the siege on Gaza. There is the siege on Gaza. There is, of course, and, and by the way, you have among you here people who are in the lead of trying to reach Palestinian reconciliation. I tell you, I, I just want to tell you one thing. There is a Palestinian homework we need to do, one of which chiefly is the reconciliation. But I just want to point, I am from Gaza. I was born in Gaza. Okay. I want to point out one thing. The separation, We're going to lose the no, 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 the separation is not only Palestinian. It's an Israeli. Since 1991, okay. I was prevented from leaving Gaza to go to the West Bank. Israel has induced this Palestinian schism. This is a fact. Right. We have to let, talk about it. Let, let me ask Dory Gold. You've just heard that assessment from Ramallah. Do you believe that that would change significantly the prospects if, and he held his fingers up, about two centimeters apart, saying it's that close between Hamas and Fatah? Well, again, if Hamas is an organization dedicated to the obliteration of Israel, which it is in its original charter, which it is in the current statements of Hamas leaders, then is that going to bring us any closer to an Israeli-Palestinian agreement? Yes, I'm afraid not. 
I know it makes some people in this audience feel good. But until Hamas transforms itself and is no longer Hamas, is no longer the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood, of the Ikhwan al-Muslimin, then this will not move negotiations right. forward. In that, in that case, I want to stop. Them back. Right. We've heard your position from Jerusalem. We've heard your position as well from Ramallah. Let me now turn at the end of our discussion, as I said we would right at the beginning, to Professor Dan Shapiro. Professor Shapiro, you are involved in international negotiation. You run a program at Harvard University. You've heard the emotions and the points put by all sides in this debate. Has your view changed? I've learned from this conversation two big points. First of all, clearly there is emotion in this room. I'd imagine this comes across very easily on TV as well. You can hear the anger. You can hear the fear. You can hear the feelings of injustice, the despair. The question is, how do you then move forward? And here's my second point, observing the situation. This is structured as a debate here. And a debate immediately pits us versus them, Palestinian versus Israeli. And I think that becomes very dangerous, ultimately, because it, it, that ultimately turns the situation into an us-them win-lose situation. If negotiation is the track forward, and as I said earlier, I believe it is, given the, the, an analysis of the alternatives, how do you shift it? so that it is everyone working side by side, dealing with the asymmetries, dealing with the feelings of injustice. How do you move it in that direction? I think that is the challenge. I'm not one who can judge whether that can happen. That ultimately is in the hands of the people of the Middle East. But from what you've heard, can you see a middle ground? Can you see room for compromise, which will achieve something which both sides, all sides, can be comfortable with? It will take work. I believe it's possible. I, I, I think the question is who are the key actors that will be involved in that process? Yes, of course the political figures need to be involved in that process. At the same time, the business leaders need to be involved in that process in their own way. The people on the ground, their voices need to be heard, as was suggested earlier in that process. I think the who is not just a simple categorical question of, oh, you know, the, the three or four political leaders, the who is the entire region that needs to work toward processes that help to organize toward joint work positive outcome. Professor Dan Shapiro, thank you very much indeed. An expert there on negotiation, bringing to an end our debate on are the right people talking in the Middle East peace process. From me, Nick Gowing, here in Marrakesh, in Morocco, thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. <laughs>